Welcome to the Painter Marketing Mastermind Podcast, a show created to help painting company owners build a thriving painting business that does well over $1 million in annual revenue. I'm your host, Brandon Pierpont, founder of Painter Marketing Pros and creator of the popular PCA educational series, Learn, Do, Grow, Marketing for Painters. In each episode, I'll be sharing proven tips, strategies, and processes from leading experts in the industry on how they found success in their painting business. We will be interviewing owners of the most successful painting companies in North America and learning from their experiences. All right, welcome everyone to the 2023 game plan. This is the first live roundtable that we are having in the Painter Marketing Mastermind Podcast Forum. I have four absolutely fantastic guests joining us today. We have Matt Kuyper, co-owner of Harpeth Painting out of Nashville, Tennessee. We have Brad Ellison, owner of Ellison Painting out of Detroit. We have Lauren Fink, owner of Apex Painting out of Hillsdale. And then Jason Phillips of Phillips Home Improvements, uh, reigning out of here from Dallas. Guys, thank you for joining. Uh, You guys are all stars and I appreciate your time. Pleasure to be uh, here, Brandon. Right. Yeah, I want to go through. I just I just did a very brief introduction, but I would love if you guys could go through one by one and just say who you are, what kind of company you run, and, and just a little bit about yourselves. Let's start with Matt. Yeah, I think you already said we're out of Nashville. Uh, we are about a 50 split, 50-50 split between commercial and residential. Uh, run the business with my wife, Maggie, who many of you probably already know. She's a much better interviewee than I am. Um, yeah, we, we kind of do a little bit of everything, commercial, residential, uh, new construction, very diverse company, which kind of keeps it fun. Awesome. Let's hit Brad. Yeah, Brad Ellison, Ellison Painting, based out of Metro Detroit, Michigan. We are a primarily a residential repaint company, um, and we actually just launched this year. Sold my first job April 22nd. <laughs> Um, scaled up pretty quickly. We're going to wrap out the year at about 1.25 million and really excited for what 2023 has in store for us. Thanks, Brad. Lauren, you are up next. Hi, I'm Lauren Fink. I own Apex Painting in Hillsdale, Michigan. Uh, we do mostly residential repaint and we have some commercial kick out, um, some has to work commercial, small commercial on the side. I have um, right now six full-time painters. I have a couple trusted sub crews and really rocking leadership team. That's us. Awesome. Thank you, Lauren. And then Jason, Jason, sorry, last yeah. but not least. Hey, Jason Phillips here from Dallas, Texas. Yeah. Phillips Home Improvements. Um, we are a residential home improvement company. We specialize in painting roofing and gutters painting is the uh, lion's share of our work and uh looking forward to an amazing uh, 2023 awesome guys appreciate you guys introducing yourselves um and appreciate you sharing your time and your expertise with us so we do have a a few things i want to kind of outline the topics that we're going to cover today you know the focus is on 2023 preparing your painting company for success obviously there's a lot of uncertainty Right now, uh, there's some concerns about an economic drawback, potentially a recession. So we will get into that. And we'll also be discussing just evergreen annual planning. So what a company should be doing, what what are the standard things that a painting company needs to do in December as you roll into a new year? Uh, And then we'll get into some more specifics in terms of of your general painting company lessons, advice you have, uh, things that, again, will be evergreen. But I want to start with how to plan for a new year. So general, general topics, general things that companies should be doing. Um, what, are, what are some of the highlights? What are some of the main things that painting companies need to be doing now as they prepare for 2023? Matt, I would love to, to get your take on this and then whoever else wants to add. I think the biggest thing, and it really happens about this time of the year, a little bit earlier, is really setting your initiatives and your goals for the next year. Because if you're already into first quarter of next year and you're thinking about what you're going to do, you're already behind. So whatever that looks like for your company, it may be maybe small goals. If you're a, a small one or two man operator, it's going to look different than if you're a $10 million painting company. But overall, just starting out the end of 2022, planning your 23 goals. 
Now, would you be would you be focused primarily on on revenue? Would you be mapping that out on a monthly basis all the way through the year? How do you you start in top down, bottom up? How do you approach it? So we typically look at a next year with four different initiatives, or if you're following the EOS system, we call them rocks. Uh, and one of those initiatives is always a revenue goal, or it should be a profit goal, not a revenue goal. So you can you back into that then monthly, quarterly, however you want to look at it to hit your revenue goals. Yeah, love that. Brad, I know we're, we're conducting a series right now for 2023. Your series will be launched by end of January here. Uh, mm -hmm. Four-part series, super exciting. But you are still technically in your first year of Ellison Painting. How are you planning, you know, your 2023? Yeah, so I think all of us, well, apart from Jason, because he's privileged to live uh, in a warm climate, uh, for all of us that have to deal with the weather, this is, uh, Matt mentioned, it's just a perfect time to be – planning for next year. We slow down. There's, there's a natural slower rhythm, um, where I live, especially this being my first year, I have a lot of time to plan. Um, so the timing is, is good to plan. I would like to mention though, that the most important part of a plan is to have one. And I think a lot of painting companies just continue to operate as is status quo. They know how to find work. They know how to complete work and they never really plan for anything different. Uh, this year, I think could, has the potential to be especially difficult if the economy really does take a dump. Um, so the companies that are planning have some plan in mind, and the plan may change over the course of the year, are going to have a huge strategic advantage over others. So for us, you know, we're 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 trying to like basically triple in size from 2022 to 2023. So what we're doing strategically planning is um, we're working on our strategic marketing plan. Uh, we're going to be implementing some new tactics that we we haven't tried in the past. Uh, and then I'm also going to be preemptively increasing my um, employee count by 150%. Now, that sounds like a lot, but really it's going from me and a project manager <laughs> to me and two project managers, uh, a salesperson and an admin. So that's that's part of our strategic plan. But just like Matt, we started with our end revenue goal in mind. You know, if we want to hit three million, Let's work backwards. What do I need in order to do that and start planning that way? Yeah. Awesome. Lauren, Jason, I'd actually like to get your guys' thoughts. I want to make sure we run through everyone on this. Uh, Jason, can you can you kick it off here? Yeah, that's uh, Matt and Brad. That's awesome stuff. You know, one of the things that that's worked for us that I've done since the pretty much the day I started the company is I take that annual goal and I break it down uh, into a monthly goal. And we have a, you know, barring any uh, COVIDs or banking crisis or anything like that, we have a fairly consistent natural curve to the way our painting business is in Dallas. And uh, one of the things I do is I take all of our numbers. Okay, you need, you need leads. You need to actually run those appointments. You need sales. You need to produce and finalize those projects. And I break those, I start with an annual goal. I apply it against uh, a seasonal curve to get a uh, monthly, actually, actually calendar week goals. And then I divide that down into the day. So we have literally for every single day, we have an amount, a, a goal for leads, appointment sets, for um, appointments issued. That means appointments that didn't set, appointments that didn't cancel for sales by product as well as finalized uh, production as well, along with uh, this year, we're, we're having daily uh, goals for our Google reviews as well. So really just comes down to breaking, breaking it down by the day because, because my people who are working on the front lines, you know, they're, they're in the trenches. They can't see down the road to the end of the month always or to the end of the quarter. Sometimes, maybe not even till Friday. I want them to know, am I winning today? Am I on track? today right now and if that's the case uh you know if we take care of our dailies then then uh then the monthlies are going to take care of themselves right so that would be my suggestion uh for anybody setting goals is try to break it all the way down to the day easy to measure and easy to uh, move the needle on a daily basis so hey jason i have a question a follow-up question on that for you because so i'm i'm heartened to know that you guys fluctuate seasonally um up in michigan we I've done this in the past where I've tried to 
put projections monthly based on historical data. And the fluctuation that I've seen, uh, when I was running my last company, our best month might be five to six hundred thousand dollars worth of sales and revenue, and our worst month is all the way down to like fifty to sixty thousand. And so, in trying to break down, like we use EOS as well, and when you when you look at a weekly scorecard, well, we have a weekly scorecard with a, 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 a amount, uh, say dollar amount closed in sales. Well. What would you recommend in a situation like that? Should we scale back those that weekly scorecard number in the winter and scale it way up in the summer or just divide it evenly by 52? How would you approach that? Well, is it, you know, is it likely that you can run 600 or whatever that high season number is during the winter? Now, I no. think we need to say in that in that month, in that season, what does success look like? And I've, you know, I've learned that, you know, in my business, generally speaking, uh but before July 4th, I get 50% of my leads, 50% of my sales, and 50% of my production. And then after is the other way. Well, 25 doesn't happen on uh, for me on uh, March 31st. It takes me all the way till April 15th to get to 25%, which is actually 15 weeks instead of 13, which leaves my kind of my fiscal quarter two at only 11 weeks. Okay. And so when I, when I start applying that, I, I've just... I've analyzed that year over year and I look at several year averages. I kind of throw out COVID year, you know, and it, cause it was an anomaly, but you know, my January goal, January and February is our slowest month. My January, February goal is nothing. My, you know, nothing like my uh, April, May goal. Yeah. Appreciate that, Jason. That is definitely a level of granularity. Uh, that's actually the most granular goal I've ever heard in my life uh, for a painting company. So breaking it down by the day, uh, where you're tracking day for day is pretty incredible. But that's also because you've spent a lot of time and we've talked about this a lot. And, and I want to dive into it further uh, as we move as we move forward through this um, live roundtable. But you've really spent a lot of time building your SOPs, building your metrics. You're extremely data driven. Uh, you have you have the the KPIs for every single member of your team. And when you get all that dialed in, it took you years. Right. So people listening that that's, uh, you know, they could they could feel you know, kind of disheartened by the fact that you're actually drilling it down to the day. And most people are lucky if they can drill it into the quarter. Uh, but you've spent years building that up. So I think it's something for everyone to aspire to um, getting to that level of granularity and, and comfort with your business where you actually know exactly where you should be on an, even a daily basis. Lauren, what it's a tough act to follow there with Jason, you know, and, and maybe, you know, predicting his hourly sales throughout 2023. But what are you doing as you prepare for the next year? We have a lot of the same things. I think a lot of it's been covered. Um, we're obviously much younger and less developed than someone like Phillips Home Improvements. So I think I think for our audience, it's important to not feel intimidated um, to remember that uh, these little freedom machines we're running are, um, they're all at different places. And they're, they're a different, you know, success and a win looks really different for each of us and to really, um, really be excited about that, that you don't have to be 15 years in to, to be having great wins. Um, the thing that comes to mind for me, and I do this a lot because I'm naturally like a super big picture thinker. So that tends to be like, I'm very visionary. So in like an EOS sense, um, that I think when you go into the new year, um, I would, I often do this even like on track at age almost 38. Um, all the time, which is just really breaking down. What do I want my life to look like? Is is being a business owner serving my family? Is am I the person I want to be? Um, is my family the kind of family that I want to have? Um, are my kids having the the experience of you know in my family at their school? All, all these factors that that I really envision for them? Is my marriage the way it, I want it to be? And going into the new year, just really breaking all of this down before you jump into like putting on the hat of like, I'm a business owner, I got to do the stuff, like everyone's just going to have to deal with me. Um, just uh, really questioning those things and being willing to reevaluate and recalibrate and say, I mean, if we're being honest, I think this is a great time of the year to say, should I be running a company? It, 
am I running because I don't want to work for someone or am I running it because I'm designed to be a business owner? Um, that, that sounds like maybe harsh, but I think it's a really good question. Um, and, uh, and to not be afraid of asking those huge questions, because if for me, if my personal goals, who I want to be as a person, my marriage, my family, my role in my community, if those things are not in line, I'm not, I'm not doing, it doesn't matter what kind of business plan I make. I can't probably even run a good business. Um, so, so I kind of took your question. I kind of diverted a little bit, but I think that is a great, um, a great thing to do essentially all the time, but at the, you know, new year time, I think it's a good question to ask and make sure that from the very foundations you're doing, you know why you're doing what you're doing. What is your business? If you're a business owner, I'm a business owner. What is Apex Painting? What is it doing for me and my family? Like, is it, am I accomplishing those goals? So I have new goals for 2023 just based on that question alone. How, how I want my business and life to be designed to best serve my family. And then from there, being able to also say, okay, what, you know, obviously what is my business need for me? How am I going to, how am I going to make those goals and then actually create goals and accountability? I love that. Yeah. I think, I think, uh, you know, you said it, it can sound kind of harsh or maybe kind of scary opening up for some people that might be a can of worms, you know, maybe they've been working on their business for years. And they, they almost don't even want to open that box. But I think when you do, you, you can kind of forget why you got into it in the first place. You're so busy putting out fires. You're so busy running. You're so busy trying to grow. They kind of forget what you're there for. And as Simon Sinek's big on, you know, start with why. I think if you know your why, if you remember your why, it's going to open your mind just in terms of your business in general, right? People, for example, people say, oh, I have subcontractors. I can never, I can never afford to hire W2 painters, right? I'm, I'm not a particularly big advocate one way or another. I think the subcontracting model is great, but, but you get into this sort of narrow-minded focus, whereas instead you say, well, let me entertain all possibilities. If I were to hire on W-2 employees instead of subcontractors, it would cost me more in this way. But would the fulfillment improve? Would I, would I run into fewer callbacks? Would I end up having higher quality? Would I get more business from that? Could I increase my profit margins by raising my prices? And, you, and your mind just kind of expanded. And you're, you're going to see opportunities that otherwise you miss. You can't keep your head in the sand. So I think it's a great point, Lauren, as you're heading into the new year. Why are you why are you in the game? We're all in this game of entrepreneurship. Why are you in the game? Make sure that that your why is strong and make sure you're moving uh, toward your life goals and your life plan. I want to kind of add to Lauren. That's great. Uh, thanks for bringing that up. It, there's often a lot more to being a business owner than just the tactical business stuff. I know our, our mutual fan, friend Jason Paris does a three day solitude retreat this time of year every year. I don't think it needs to be that drastic, but I would say take even just a few hours or, or some time out of your day to evaluate not only your business, but kind of what you want your life to look like. Because as business owners, we are in control of that. Uh, I know Jason has a lot to say about uh, what's your triple crown stuff, Jason. Time, money, and freedom. Money and freedom. Yep. Yeah. We, we are capable of bringing that to ourselves. And sometimes you just got to step back and, and be a little introspective and plan uh, not the business tactical stuff, but just the feelings part of it as well. Absolutely. So <clears throat> we have focused a lot in terms of actually planning the numbers on revenue goals, right? Certain it's a top line approach. I think it's the approach that really makes the most sense. What are you guys trying to hit year back into it? Factor in seasonality. As Jason said, you can look at historical years when you're doing that. Um, and then if you're new, you, you do sort of have to take a guess, right? And then you factor in whatever you want your growth ramp to be. How are you guys looking at budgeting? Because that's obviously the next step. When you look at revenue, then you need to start looking at your budgeting. How do you guys approach that? Anyone can kick off. So we have, I, I kind of stole some numbers from some of our colleagues uh, nationwide as I was trying to figure out what to budget for employees. Uh, so for every, um, uh, in, in trying to figure out a compensation plan, we budget essentially 7% for a project manager, 7% uh, for sales, um, right now, I'm budgeting about 10% of our, our gross projected gross revenue for marketing, which was I actually was under that my first year, which is surprising. Um, about half of our sales 
I looked at, you know, just a few days ago, about half our 1.25 million was referrals and word of mouth, like crazy for our first eight months of business. Um, but in, uh, that's not sustainable. Right. And I, I, I contradict people all the time. Like, well, ah, I've, gr I've grown my business for 15 years using just word of mouth and referrals. But like there's a point where you can't get any more than that. If we can keep getting that $600,000 a year in sales and referrals, that's great. But I'm going to intentionally spend more money in marketing. So if the goal is 3 million, I'm, I need to be willing to spend what? 300,000 this coming year in marketing. So break that down. It's 20, about $24,000 per month. And I'm going to start spending that in February, even before it's going to be another two and a half months after that, before really any of that revenue starts to become realized with our exterior jobs that we sell. Um, so that's, those are our primary, you know, you know, the, our, we subcontract. So about 40, uh, 47 to 48% goes out to labor directly. About 12% goes out to materials and that's, those are the, the big pieces of our budget. I think that uh, perspective is really good, Brad, on what the industry averages are. I know you and I have talked about this and our, our marketing spend is three, three ish percent, three and a half. So I think as we go into next year, we know that there's a lot laying on the table that we can potentially bring in it. If, if we do see a downturn in the economy or just to support natural growth, uh, we know that other people are spending more and getting more in return than what we are. Yeah, I want to dive into that too, because that, that number is astounding for people, right? Brad just said $24,000 per month on marketing. So if you're if you're hiring an agency, that would include what you're paying them. If you're doing ad spend, whether it's through Facebook, pay-per-click, if you're buying leads uh, through Angie, Thumbtack, whatever your strategy is, that would all go toward marketing. If you have an internal marketing person, you might want to add that. <clears throat> but 24000 is mind-boggling for most companies, especially panty companies, they, they would think that that's absolutely insane. But when you actually run the numbers, if you're between eight and 12%, that's if you want aggressive growth. Mm -hmm. Brad just, just did 10%, right? Aggressive growth. Matt just said, okay, he's at 3%. Three to five is essentially sustain and grow. You know, a lot of it will be the re referral repeat business. Matt um, has a large com commercial component to his business. It's, it is more relationship driven than some of the other companies. Uh, but, but think about these numbers, right? Because they, it, it depends on, Again, Lawrence, what's your why? What are you trying to achieve with your business? How, how fast do you want it to grow? Do you want it to just be a lifestyle business and something that you enjoy doing? Are you trying to do what Brad's doing, uh, which is extremely ambitious? He has very ambitious goals. So he's going to invest into those goals and kind of bet on himself and his company. If I can chime in real quick, we do have a question yeah. from a user asking what type of marketing I do. So I'm happy to speak on that real quick. Yeah. Um, and I, guys, before I want to throw up. So there's a link here. Uh, I'm going to post it. Should show up. There it is. So if you go to that link, you can grant StreamYard access to your name and, and I think your photo. So we actually know who you are because otherwise we just see Facebook user. We can answer the questions, but it'd be great if we know who you are too. Mm -hmm. So I have a, uh, a digital agency. I use Service Legend out of um, Arizona. It's Ryan Davis, a good friend of mine. So he manages my uh, Google SEO, PPC, and um, Facebook advertising. That accounts for right now is about $7,500 total per month. And we're going to increase the ad spend on Facebook and, and Google. Uh, probably not significantly because I'm not super crazy about Facebook ads, um, but they, there's a volume there. So even though the average closing rate is low and the average job size is lower, it's going to provide me the leads to keep to feed another salesperson, essentially. Um, we're going to go way deep on door hangers and every dire every door direct mailing come in February. So uh, we had been doing about 5000 mailing pieces a week, and I'll be increasing that to maybe 10 to 12000. And that's going to be a combination of the door hangers and EDDM. So between the, the digital and the um, the mailing and door hangers, that's going to be the the lion's share of my marketing spend. Nick, Nick just uh, said he just did it. Did it work? It did work, Nick. We can see your name and your photo. Thanks for doing that StreamYard link. Uh, Jason, Lauren, do you guys have anything, anything to add to this topic? Kind of as your how you're budgeting, how you're planning your marketing out for 2023. Lauren, <laughs> Lauren, uh, hot seat. I'm my plan. Uh, no, we do have a plan, but I'm also just taking notes from Brad. So, <laughs> well, Lauren, I can, I can interject. Uh, you're a panelist and you're also an audience member taking notes over here. That's good. <laughs> Aren't we all? That's good. So, um, you know, when it comes to, when it comes to, you know, budgeting, um, I use target allocation percentages. 
and I say, okay, if you know, 100% is my projected revenue. And then the next thing I'm going to take out is define what I want my profit to be, that I'm going to take out my cost of goods sold, blah, blah, blah. And look at those high level numbers. One of the things we have to be careful with is getting down, measuring the blades of grass instead of the lawn so to say, or looking at the trees instead of the forest. It's important to pinch pennies, but you also, you know, if, if you're an owner operator or you're out there selling, uh, some people may disagree with me on this, but a few more contracts will sure, sure take care of a lot of waste elsewhere. So what you don't want to do is step over dollars to pick up dimes. So that's, that's one thing. Ultimately those dimes are important too, but they're not as important as the dollars. And at what point you can have people, managing the dollars and the dimes that's you know that's a win but the uh, uh over over to marketing one of the things that i want to do is is i want to have a mix of 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 marketing uh channels okay because you never know when something is going to let's just say for instance you're one of those people that do all their advertising on tiktok not a lot in our industry do but there are industries that do well, what happens if, if, if all of a sudden TikTok is banned in the USA and that was your revenue stream? Okay, back in the, what was it, the 90s, there were literally uh, mortgage companies and, and finance companies that met, had their only marketing channel was fax, fax machine advertising. And when the FCC uh, outlawed that, so many of them went out of business. And I've, I've been bitten by mailers that you know I paid for that didn't get, that really didn't get delivered. I could tell because the phone didn't ring. So I want to have uh, multi-channel marketing and I want to be uh, anywhere that my target demographic is my ideal customer. I want to be on their phone. I want to be on their computer. I want to be in their mailbox. I want to be at their front door, all of those different places. And it's, you know, depending on where you're at and how much time you can put into marketing, diversifying uh, is not easy, but we need to, I, I think as you grow, need to have the idea that I need to have, you know, start diversifying. Don't diversify and then let you, you know, if, if you try to diversify too much, you're not going to get good at anything either. And that, that's not going to work. So knowing where you're at in that process, what you should focus on. But I would definitely say don't rely on one or even two lead sources. I would have at least, you know, at least four or five lead sources that I was, you know, getting leads from. Yeah. And I, and I would like to add on that as you diversify your marketing tactics, tracking your data becomes even more important because your revenue might go up. But if you don't know what lead source the, the lion's share of that revenue is coming from, then you're missing out. You're, that's where you're, you're stepping over the dollars to pick up the dimes, right? Because you might start investing more in one tactic when it's really another one that's giving you a much higher ROI. And right. so that's part of our strategy is we're going to we're going to of course, come up with a, a plan for the year, but every month we're monitoring our ROI on each marketing tactic, and then we will shift marketing dollars to whatever is proving to be more uh, profitable. Yeah, so I, I want to follow up with a couple of things there, Jason. I want to make sure people really pull away we, uh, the nuggets of what you just said. So you're talking about five to, five to seven different marketing strategies, right? And you're saying don't put all your eggs in one basket. Facebook's constantly changing their algorithm. It's an auction process when you advertise it. They, they used to be organic posts. Everyone who followed your page would would find it, would see it. Now organic posts only have about a 10% reach, which is why they want you to boost all your posts, right? Pay-per-click, pay-per-click ad costs have gone up this year. Pay-per-click, Google's always changing their al algorithm. Again, another auction process. So if you're just all in on, on Google ads, or you're all in on your Facebook ads, or you're, or you're all in on your flyers, that, that might dry up, right? Or it might all of a sudden become one day a lot more expensive per lead. Um, so it is important to have multiple fishing lines in the water. Another thing you said that is very critical that a lot of people miss is you have to be at a certain size, a certain scale for that to make sense. If you're saying, well, I'm going to run Facebook ads, I'm just going to put $500 into it. And I'm going to run a pay-per-click, I'm going to put $500. Well, then you just got to throw your money away. You just kind of throw little bits of money away everywhere. When you have a smaller budget, you do need to be more targeted in the beginning. Maybe you have one to two sources. And then as your company scales, Jason obviously runs a, a pretty large company at this point, you can then start to diversify that budget while still giving it the appropriate amount of investment to actually make sure it works. There's a minimum threshold there. Glenn asked for you, Brad, um, and I know Nick responded that dope marketing is good, but he asked for the direct mail, What whether you do that in-house or whether you use a company to help you with that. 
So direct mail, there's actually a franchise that I use, um, International Minute Press. It's the same it's same company yeah. that Nick Slavic uses up in Minnesota. I just found a local franchise here. And um, it's a so it's a franchise. So the guy that I work with is the owner and they've been great for the EDDM. He's super reliable um, door hanger. Also, I have a local vendor here. It's not through an agency, um, but each of those companies can handle the the design, the printing, the distribution. So all I got to do is help them craft the plan. You know, here's here's how many I want to send. Here's some of the areas I want to target. And then they take it and run with it from there. Yeah, and one other. Oh, go ahead, Lauren. Sorry, I was just going to add that um, for those of you who are on kind of a smaller scale. So I'm one of the companies that we did about 600k in in revenue in 2022, and it was all organic. So um, I've just begun using. I've just spent my first, like literally this month, our first money on any ads. So I'm I'm just like slowly getting into this and realizing kind of where the faucets are and where I want to turn them on. But um, ED, EDDM is designed through the US mail system to be you can on a smaller scale, you can do it by yourself with relative ease. And if, for those of you, I'm not in a big city. Um, I'm in rural so, South Central Michigan. And um, I know rural my rural area pretty well. So pinpointing the neighborhoods and the areas that I know I would like to send mailers to, um, I my gut feeling is that I'm going to know that a little bit quicker than a mar you know a marketing company because we aren't it's a little more unique and um, kind of country area. So um, just just as a reminder that dipping into the EDDM without anyone's help, I think it's that's kind of low hanging fruit. Whereas running Facebook ads. Um, I've learned working with Pathfinder that there's a lot of nuances to making those work well that I don't find very intuitive. So that's just a thought about direct mail. It's very powerful. And I think um, I think it's one of the easier ways to get into marketing. Maybe I'm maybe you guys have other thoughts about that. So guys, that one of the things that we need to keep in mind, regardless of what channel. When you're talking in marketing, there's there's two concepts of reach and frequency. And if you're whether you're talking EDDM or Facebook or whatever it is, the idea is you're better off to if, instead of sending you know a hundred thousand flyers to a hundred thousand one flyer to a hundred thousand people, you're better off to send ten flyers to ten thousand people one month at a time, spaced mm -hmm. out. That way you become, it's top of mind awareness. Very few people are going to click on your ad or call you or go to your website based on the first time they see your ad. Mm -hmm. So you have to stick with it. So you're better off to pick a smaller group and make sure that they know your name. And it takes, it takes consistency to do that. Yeah, I think three, yeah, yeah. I think three flyers is like by the third one, you get, um, you get a return that you can't get in the first two, if I remember right. Yeah, the uh, most homeowners, especially when you're talking higher ticket prices, they really need to be touched five to seven times. And that's where the automations, Tanner's drip jobs, does a great job of automations, um, helps with those touch points, but sending the mailers to them multiple times, reaching them, as Jason said, online and offline. There becomes a, a power. It's an exponential power when people see you in multiple different ways. When it's not just all they've seen your Facebook ads and they've seen it a bunch of times, but they saw your Facebook ad, they saw a, line, a lawn sign, they saw a wrapped van. They got something in the mail. All of a sudden, you're, you're kind of in their world. So if you can get really good at targeting, and like Lauren said, she knows where the community she serves. She knows where she wants to, to work. She knows where the right work is, where her dream customer is. If you can hyper-target that dream customer online, offline, multiple different ways, you, you start to just become top of mind for them. Um, so when they need to, to hire a company or someone asks them for a referral, you are, you're right there when it's ready, when it's time to go. Um, Brad, so you made a really good comment uh, about how important it is to track your performance, to track your data and how this becomes more complicated uh, and even more important, the more channels you get as you kind of spread horizontally, as Jason's been talking about. Someone, uh, Tony asked, how do you track marketing performance? How do you keep revenue streams designated by source? So part of it is through drip jobs, which is what we use as our CRM. There are some high level metrics that are tracked through there. So I can see 
you know, the amount of revenue, for example, that was generated through each of my lead sources. That's one of their default metrics. Um, it doesn't give a ton of uh, detail um, within Drip Jobs. So we actually keep a separate spreadsheet that we, we track for all of our sales through Google Sheets. And that allows us to track in a lot more granularity um, things like uh, we can break it down by zip code. You know, how many, how many sales do we have in zip code? And what was the average job size within that zip code? And how many, how many, how many, how much revenue did one crew able, were they able to produce for us this year based on how many days they worked? So how profitable is one crew versus another? And that allows us again to shift not only marketing dollars, but uh, we can shift more and more projects to the more profitable, easier to work with crews. So uh, drip jobs does a lot of it. And, um, you just got to take those numbers, refer back to how much you're actually spending for those. And you can find out your cost per lead, your cost per acquisition. And that data is super helpful in figuring out what the ROI is. Yeah, so everyone, would... <clears throat> you'll notice that, that a consistent theme here is profitability. Mm -hmm. So that, that's what everyone keeps diving into is profitability. It's not just the revenue. What Brad just talked about, know your sub crews well, or know your employees well. What production numbers do they need to meet? And then if one sub crew is, is doing better than the other, then try to lean more toward them because at the end of the day, revenue is vanity, profit is sanity. I think all of it starts with, if you're a startup business or, or shoot, there's a lot of companies out there that, that are mature and not doing it, but starting with the job costing and you can actually in a rudimentary <clears throat> way, track your leads and your marketing, your referrals, all that stuff through your job costing. If your job costs in, in Excel or whatever it may be, you don't need fancy software. Uh, especially smaller companies can just brute force that and it'll give you a lot of information right off the bat. So Aaron, Aaron had a good question. He said he loves the growth talk. It kind of moves us into the next major topic for today. On the flip side, what are some strategies when we see the changes in the economy uh, to stay ahead of the tsunami. Obviously, people are concerned about a potential recession. How are you guys feeling and addressing that? I'll take Honestly, that one. You want to go, Brad? Go I'll ahead. start. Yeah, first yeah. off, shout out to Aaron, who's a member of the Ellison Painting Wall of Champions. Thanks for joining us today. Woo -woo. Hey, yo. Um, so, honest, for me, it's, it's a little different than maybe Jason would answer because he's 15 years in and I'm eight months in. Uh, for me, I'm just continuing forward boldly and I'm making decisions based on uh, what I would consider just normal scenarios. I'm not necessarily planning for a recession. I'm moving forward as if nothing is really going to change. Um, but even if it does, in, in speaking to guys like Jason that have been through the in the industry for so long and maybe were, were around during the 2008 recession, the feedback that I got was the companies that had systems and um, had taken the effort to professionalize their business were the ones that not only survived the 2008 recession, but absolutely thrived. Uh, the bigger companies can weather a slowdown. Um, they can adjust their scale. They can move some money around to ma maintain profitability. And the smaller guys that had always referred on just word of mouth referrals and just didn't really know where the next job was going to come from, if those next jobs didn't come, they folded and they either completely left the industry or ended up to, they went to work for Jason Phillips. Right. So I think that it's an opportunity for companies now to, to buckle down when it comes to professionalization and systemizing their businesses so that if there is a recession, it's actually not a threat. It's an opportunity. Yeah. Very similar to what Brad's said. Um, I look at it two ways. We kind of have a retreat plan. Um, uh, on the book, so to speak, like if, if things really do get bad, this is the step we take first. This is the step we take next and so forth until it's, yeah, I have you know, a hard time seeing you retreat at all. You're, uh, <laughs> you're, you're well, it, it just feels, it feels comfortable to have that plan in place. Yeah. You're not blindsided if you got to do it. Uh, but on the complete flip side, I don't let that dictate my mindset. I, I have a growth mindset for next year. In fact, we have a new project manager coming in the end of January. Um, and a lot of it goes to what Brad said is I think there's huge opportunities for the professionalized companies out there, especially the ones that have the ability to invest, to grow. Uh, I think it's the, the less professionalized companies that are going to struggle that don't have a plan, don't have a marketing plan, don't have a production plan. Uh, you know, watch your numbers, know where everything is. And 
I think there's nothing but growth in 2023 for most painting companies. Lauren, Jason, you guys want to add to this at all? 2023 economic potential economic drawback and how you're preparing or thinking about it. I'm, I'm curious to see how it plays out for the home improvement sector, because, um, you know, the, your home is, is one of the foundational assets. So if things do tighten up, I mean, you know, the things that you, that you might not want to put money into, um, I'm curious to see if homes, um, in our area, improving your home, um, is just the demand, especially for exterior work is just unbelievably high. And, um, their, your home is people's homes are really important. Um, it's something that they save up money for years to spend. Um, I've had several clients in the last year who described to me how many years they saved to get that big paint job and re, you know, refinish and carpentry work done. Um, so I don't know that that's, I would be surprised if that really goes away because that is one asset that you just, you know, you have, and you can hang on to, and it's going to, it's going to work for you as a, as property kind of always has. So. And I think that ties in really, really nicely with um, what I think Brad and Matt were saying, you know, when there's a, a pullback in the economy and, and people, you know, get a little more concerned potentially or inflation or, or whatnot goes up, they're still going to invest into their homes. That's still going to happen. But what's going to happen is they're going to become more selective about the company they hire. It has been just a tailwind. It's been unsustainable. The supply demand curve has been out of control. Uh, I've mm -hmm. talked with people who, who had just launched a painting company and they shouldn't have, right? They're, they shouldn't have. They're not, they're not qualified to do it. They're not approaching it right. And they're not going to be here in a year. I can, I can guarantee it for some of these people. So there's going to be a professionalization. I think the tide is going to, is going to raise. Um, that the bar is going to raise because homeowners are going to become more selective. But like Brad said, best defense is a good offense. It is an opportunity. The herd is going to be thinned a little bit. But if you professionalize and you step up your company, you're going to be richly rewarded. And the economy obviously moves in cycles. When that cycle turns back and it becomes very bullish again, uh, you take off. So it's an opportunity for growth. Lean into it. Play to win. Abundance mindset, uh, not a scarcity mindset. Jason, I know you have some awesome stuff to add here. Yeah, you know, through the years, um, I, I agree with a lot with what, what Lauren said. Through the years, uh, when the economy's been down, people are still investing into their home. Maybe they're not doing the full kitchen remodel or whatever, but they still want to make sure that their home, that they do life in, that they sleep in, that needs to be a sanctuary, a piece of place of peace, is well taken care of. And uh, when, when times start getting tight, the first dollars – that companies stop spending are marketing dollars. And I see that as an opportunity to gobble up market share. Yeah. And that's my goal every single time there's a downturn. Yeah. So we have focus for everyone listening. You know, it's really important to pull out the trends, right? All four of these people are highly successful. They all, all live in different markets, run a little bit different companies and, and they don't all approach things the same way, but you're going to see, trends of the most successful painting company owners again and again and again, right? Two of the trends that we've seen so far are a focus on profitability, right? Knowing, knowing their numbers. So focus on profitability, knowing the numbers, and then a growth oriented mindset. When other companies are scared or other companies are pulling back, they're going to go ahead and move forward. And that's how they're going to increase and take additional market share. Like, like Jason is obviously runs a, a very, Jason, what are you, do you mind sharing what your revenue is anticipated to be for 2022? For for 2022, looks like we're going to hit just short. I'm looking at the I'm looking at my scoreboard up here, just short of eight million. So eight shooting. million, right? Yeah. So Jason's at eight million. So that is a uh, that's a big company, and he's gotten there by by this kind of mindset that he plays with. So there was a a follow up question related to this uh, that I want to talk ask you guys. So in anticipating a recession, this is from Tony. Is it wise to diversify services going into it? Or would it be too late for that and more effective to focus in on existing services slash systems? I think that can be really, um, I think that can be really unique to your market. Um, it's my first thought, just that like I know my market and there's a couple offshoots that pair with painting that I see a ton of demand in my area for. Um, 
I don't think I could advise anyone else to diversify that same way. I don't know. I don't know what your market is like, and um, I don't know what your ability is to juggle different things. I think some people are designed better to um, have different irons in the fire and others really need to focus in. Um, and I also think if you're, if you have not stabilized your first mm -hmm. essentially business, your first product, what you sell, if you haven't stabilized that, you would probably have no business diversifying um, unless you can't stabilize it and you actually just need to change mm -hmm. your business, then you should. <laughs> um, so that's just, that's one thought. Jason, did you want to go? Yeah. So I've, I've, I've got some thoughts on that. If you're going to, if you want to diversify, you know, is it, is it going to take a new sales process? Is it going to take different advertising channels? Is it going to take a different, you know, clients? I look at it this way. If, if, if I can still serve that same homeowner's need, I can, I have a database of that I can market to virtually free of my own clients over the years through email, uh, phone calls, uh, mailbox, whatever. And if I just have to teach my sales guys how to sell something new and I can find workers to, to get it done, then it's, it's pretty easy. The danger, again, like, like Lauren said, the danger is that you dilute your focus and, and you lose ground on, on your primary breadwinning uh, product or service. So I would be careful about, about, you know, a lot of, a lot of in our area, probably in yours too, a lot of uh, home improvement contractors do Christmas lights when it's cold out, mm -hmm. right? That's very common. You know, the painters already have ladders. I think that's a no brainer. You know, if you can, if you can do that, it's your same customer. They already know and love you. Of course, you've already worked on their house with ladders. They're probably going to trust you for Christmas lights as well. Or is it something totally, totally different outside of your lane? And uh, just make sure that you, my, my first piece of advice is make sure there's someone on your team that has the bandwidth to champion that product or that service, that they can own it. That would be my first piece of advice. I think there's two different ways to look at this too. And I don't know where, uh, who asked this question? This Tony. was Tony, Tony, Tony. Barg. Uh, Tony, if you can let us know, know where uh, you're at a little bit about your company, that'd be great. Because we're a very diverse painting company. We do residential repaint. We do residential custom new construction. We do commercial new construction. We do commercial repaint. We do, uh, we're really getting into uh, flooring, epoxy flooring. So all those things are very synergistic and very similar sales cycles, even though we kind of run two divisions of our business. Uh, but I was also founded and was partners in a hardwood flooring company. And it was blew my mind how different of a business that was. The sales cycle was different. The production was different. And it there was no synergy between that and my painting company like I thought there would be. So I exited that business and allowed me to focus back on what I was good at here. So I think there's there's opportunity if you want to diversify within the the painting industry is a whole lot easier than adding, say, you know, uh, home renovation or whatever it may be. Yeah. Brad, do you have anything to add on this? I mean, for I can only speak for me personally, and I would say that in the midst of a recession, I wouldn't consider uh, diversifying our services. Um you know, Jason mentioned Christmas tree lights, something like that is going to be the first thing that homeowners are going to cut out if they're really trying to tighten their belts, right? They're not going to pay to hang Christmas lights because that's not a need, whereas painting often can be a need. Um, I would say the time to diversify would be when things are good, things are humming, you've you've really stabilized your operation, growth is is healthy, and then you focus on other things. I'm interested to hear from Jason, when you, when you guys expanded from painting into uh, roofs and gutters, did you do that in the midst of an economic downturn or when things were going well? A great question, Brad. We actually did that uh, when things were going well. Yeah. I got, I started, first thing I did was gutters because I was going out on these exterior quotes and they had rotten fascia boards or old galvanized gutters that were rotted through and they needed to replace those mm -hmm. before we could paint. 
And so they didn't know who to call for a gutter company. So I'm waiting on them. They want to hire me. They want me to, you know, they want me to paint their house and I need, I needed to put food on the table that, that weekend, you know, Mm -hmm. or that week. And I, uh, so finally I just got sick of, of, of that holding up my jobs. I called a local, you know, gutter, uh, vendor, uh, material vendor and said, Hey, I want to learn how to do gutters. Mm -hmm. And the manager, the manager literally came out and told me or met when he said, Hey, you get the stuff and I'll come over and teach you guys. And he came and we did my house. My house was literally the, uh, the, the first house we did. And I learned so much in doing that. And now all of a sudden I was getting not just the paint jobs faster, but I was getting a gutter work that went with it. Sure. And that, I mean, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, that kind of proves my point that when you have the time and the financial resources to correctly develop a new vertical, that's the time to strike rather than out of desperation. And, and I think Lauren hit a good thing, hit a good point. You know, there, there might be a time uh, I, I'm not so arrogant to think that Ellison painting is the, you know, some unicorn that would absolutely survive a recession or a depression. If push comes to shove, I'd be more apt to just leave the painting game entirely and, and change industries. Um, I, I don't know. Yeah. yeah. I think those are great points. Uh, Brad, I'm really glad that you brought up this, this idea of whether you're doing it in a, uh, you know, a good economy or kind of a pullback because most, most, and it goes back to marketing. Most painting company owners think that they've tapped out a market well before they have. So they think, Oh, we need to, we need to go downstream or we need to cross sell or we need to do something else. Or we need to expand geographically. We need another location. But if you actually sit down and look at your numbers and you're tracking them the way that these four people are tracking them, you'll realize you you've most likely only gotten a very small percentage of your, your TAM, your total addressable market. Mm-hmm. So know your numbers, know your market. If you're serving, I spoke with a company recently that had a million uh, people in their service radius, uh, they they are trying to target the top 10%. So you should know that. If you don't know this kind of stuff, you should. And they're, so they were, they had a 100,000 um, total addressable market. And they thought that they were tapped out while they were doing less than a million in revenue, right? So we ran through the numbers and realized that they they don't need to do these drastic changes that they're thinking about. If you want to start rolling in from painting into gutters or roofing, that's a panic reaction. Most likely you're, it's not the right reaction because the sales process, the fulfillment, everything's different. You're going to drag your name through the mud and you're going to weigh down your team. But like Jason said, if you want to, if you want to offer Christmas lights, they might cut it. They might not be interested because they, it might be the first thing that they cut per Brad, but you can, there's not, no harm in sending an email, right? Mm-hmm. Customer database reactivation, you're either contact, send out an email. You might get some sales that come through the door. So you can hustle, you can offer things to your existing customers, things that are not going to bog your team down. It's also an uh, easy mental, it's an easy mental game to play when things aren't working the way you want it to, to just start, you know, you can just, why not just start something else? Blame the industry, blame uh, the market. Uh, I think we, sorry. Well, Could you hear me? Yep. Yeah. Okay. yeah, we can hear you. Okay. Yeah. And so um, I think it's a good reminder and this goes back to, I mean, there's nothing there that it can't be said enough that the impetus for professionalizing um, the, the, the thing with home improvement in the trades is that there's too often, there's just nothing making you professionalize. You can just, you can just run kind of a hack business. You'll get lots of business. You'll make probably make some money. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm down here in Houston. My brother's having a huge renovation down on his home for six months. Um, and like talking to him about his contractor and he's, this is a contractor that most of his neighborhood has used and he's just an asshole and difficult and moody and uh and you're just going like this is hilarious like this guy is like kind of popular and basically people have said like well he's better than the guys who don't actually do the work so (laughs) so like he's like the preferred contractor i mean the the opportunity to professionalize and offer great customer service in the trades is just there is no bounds there is no limit and um and so i just think that when you when you have the time when when things are good um actually knowing your numbers actually building a good team um actually having sops having contracts for your customers to sign all these like things that are simple and obvious in other industries um do yourself a favor and do them and start to see how they begin to work for you um and they and they they support everything you're doing, and you you have a much better business. So I think, as people again, just planning wise, that is um, 
that just can't be, it can't be said enough. I built my company to a certain size just, um, just so I could hire someone who can do numbers and stats. Cause this is my, my weakness. So knowing what you're capable of, knowing what you're good at, um, knowing the kind of team you need to build, you're not going to, most people don't do things in isolation super well. Um, that has been, I think that's a really good point for planning and, and just realizing I immediately had a vision of who I needed to hire. I needed an incredible PM. Um, I knew I was not going to be the field leader that my company would need. Hired him. We built the company up to um, over half a million. So mainly so I could hire this administrative side um, financial brain, because I knew if I want to have the company I need, I can't necessarily be that brain. So mm. professionalization is really a, a matter of being honest and planning and doing a lot of really miserable work that then works works for you and allows you to have the company you really want. Yeah, go ahead, Jason. Uh, you're muted, Jason, brother. You're, you sound you. better when we can yeah. hear you. Thank <laughs> you. <laughs> well, thanks for the compliment. Mm -hmm. That was, that was <laughs> awesome. Man. That was a great fight. I would challenge everybody that, you know, if, if we're, we're going to assume for a moment, I'm going to make the assumption that pretty much everybody uh, listening to this podcast, that, that you want to grow your business. Mm -hmm. And maybe you, as a part of that, you want to have, you know, not just the money, but you want to have time and freedom as well. And, you can you can spend money or you can spend time mm -hmm. if you have if you spend money you can implement systems you can hire third parties you can hire employees or you can spend your own time so you can spend someone else's time or you can spend your time and if if you will you know may, maybe you're that guy or, or that lady that that you're still trying to master the making of the widget right and if you can, if you can get your team to deliver your product, your service without much of your interaction, get your production team rolling, right? You can then focus on sales and marketing and improving that process, but try to make each thing begin to run without you having to do it personally, but you have the oversight and you know, the KPIs uh, to, to, uh, measure whether it's working or whether someone's doing their job or delivering the value that you need. And then once you do that, then, then you can start developing more people. And it, it comes down to, you know, people and systems. And if you don't have people and systems, then you're left with your nose to the grindstone all year long. And maybe you're just going to have a high paying, a high paying job, which is really just a high paying uh, slave driver. Yeah. So, yeah. You end up in contractor prison. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, that's contract. right. <laughs> that too. Contractor prison. And, it's, so, and people ask constantly, why can't I keep people? I can't find good work. Are you someone that people want to work for? I mean, this is a huge question. Are you setting people up? Do they know what a win looks like? I mean, this is, we ask this of ourselves all the time. It's not a, it's not a one and done kind of answer. Do my people know what it looks like to win? from my new guy who does mostly prep and taping and unmasking and cleaning machines to our lead painter on a job who has, you know, a work plan and has to execute it and get a sign off to my PM who has to run the whole field. Does he know what a win looks like? Does he know what he's doing, how he's doing and if he's winning and what he's going toward? I mean, what are, what are you working toward? If you can't create that for, your people you i mean you're not why would they want to stay with you why mm -hmm. they look over and see someone who feels the satisfaction of knowing they're in a job and they're move, working toward a goal um i read something recently that said people really it's not the highest paying job where people have the most satisfaction it's it's um feeling like they're con they're contributing to something good they're part of something great They'll work, they'll work extra hours for, for less pay when they feel that personal satisfaction. And it's as easy as asking the question. It's like, it's like, it's, it can be scary. Like asking your spouse, like, what can I do to be a better wife? Ask your employees, you know, what, what would be, 
what would make you happy in your work? What would make things easier? You know, what would bring satisfaction? Um, having those open conversations, especially at quarterly reviews, I, I find those just so insightful and you get all the answers. The crazy part when we just had quarterly reviews is that your team will repeat, you'll hear the same thing. They all know the answer. Here are the things that make us happy. Here are the things that we would love to be better. Um, but you have to ask the question. You have to be interested in the answer. Mm-hmm. Lauren, you're bringing us the hard and scary questions to ask mm-hmm. ourselves and others. And it seems so simple, so intuitive. Like, hey, ask them what, what they want. Ask them how they like working for you. But yet it's actually so rarely done. And part of it is we don't want to. We want to look like we have it all figured out. We want to, oh, we're, we're the boss. We, we don't need to ask them. We, we already want to, you know, there's this imposter syndrome that a lot of people suffer from. If you ask, you, you show weakness or you show maybe you don't have it all figured out. But that honesty, that transparency is going to get you the respect of the people who work for you. And it's going to allow you to, to build up loyalty. It's going to allow you to better their lives. And, and really, I mean, that's, that's what a lot of us want to do, right? It's why a lot of us have a company, because you can have an impact on people and make the world a better place. I know, Jason, you're extremely big on that. Uh, Brad. Yes. Yeah. So um, Gil Perez asked a question. He just asked it for a second time that I think that we should all touch on because this is all something that I know all five of us are really passionate about. So his question was, what did you all do from uh, what did you all do from burning out from being overworked? What processes did you put in place, if any, to maintain a healthy professional life? So uh, we started our company or, you know, my wife and I quit our jobs right after we got married and started our first business, which is a health insurance agency, so that we would have the freedom to set our own schedule, make our own money and make our own decisions in our life. And most people, when they launch a business, that's that's the goal, right? Time, money, freedom. Right. So the for us, we my wife and I will only make decisions for our business that will not sacrifice our family health. I don't I don't answer work questions or work inquiries after five o'clock unless I want to. You know, if someone reaches out, I'll just ignore them until the next day. I put hard boundaries that when it's when it's family time, it's family time. And when people ask, well, I, I don't get home until 430. How I need an estimate in the evening. I said, I'm sorry. I want to be home for dinner every day by five or 530. Uh, I don't do evening estimates. So if you can't meet during the day, then maybe we're not going to be the right fit for you. So the first thing is just to put boundaries in place. Um, but also Rachel and I, we, we intentionally live below our means, which means we can afford to take less money out of our business, which then means we can put more money, keep more money in our business in order to grow with money rather than time. So I haven't had to sacrifice a lot of my time to go out and actually hang door hangers to generate more business. I use the money, use our money to pay someone to do that. Um, but it, this all still goes back to the very first question that we were talking about earlier was, you got to have a plan. If you want to have processes in place to maintain a healthy professional life, then what, what's the end goal? What, what's the revenue or the profitability that you would need in order to feel like you can take a step back? And then what are the steps that you can put into place to get you to that final goal so that you have, you can take more time off and have a more balanced life. Yeah. yeah have I your agree with everything. Not, not your life, serve your business. Mm-hmm. Matt. I agree with that, Brad. It's the kind of the mindset of begin with the end in mind. We started our business very similar to that, where it's, you know, this thing isn't going to be an 80 hour work machine. It's just not. And, and that's how we're going to grow this business. I think it might be harder if you've already put yourself in that corner. I think it's hard to get out of it. Yeah. But speaking in, in painting terminology, if you haven't painted yourself in that corner yet, just don't, you don't need to. So David had a question. I, I think I know how you guys are going to respond to this, but he said, how are you pricing this year's exteriors uh, compared to last year's pricing with how everything's changed? I guess the, the overall question w- would be, are you reducing prices because of a potential economic drawback or recession? I know what my prices need to be w- regardless of what the market says they need to be. And I, uh, I actually sent out an email to all my outstanding exterior estimates from last year and told them if I didn't hear from them within seven days, I was officially closing it out. And if they want a new estimate for 2023, I'm happy to provide it with updated and increased to 2023 pricing. Did you get any anyone to, to come through from that? Any kind of sense of urgency? Yeah, I had three that had uh, accepted the proposals. That's great. We, we did the same thing. 
It's great. I mean, it's standard, right? I, I, uh, I don't really eat at McDonald's. I did, I'll, I'll be honest, um, like a week ago. I think it cost me $9 for the meal. I was blown away. It used to cost $5. Price increases are, are standard. They increase across the board. You should be increasing them with your company as well, especially as labor, as labor rates increase. Jason. You know, there is this pervasive mindset in this industry that painting is a commodity and that it's all about the price. Like it's like gasoline, how many dollars and cents per gallon. Okay. And if, if you're one of those guys, you have to break that mindset because people are not, uh, your, your painting product, your service is only a commodity if that's how you market and sell it, period. Okay, because people, they want a company they can trust mm -hmm. to invest in, if, if you're working for homeowners like we are, to, to take care of their home. One of the, for most people, probably their most valuable asset. It's about the experience. It's about the ease of doing business with you. It's about the smile at the end of it. <clears throat> and it's, if it's all about the price to you, then you need to build more value into your sales presentation or your USP. It's not about price. Yes. Say, say, that again, say that again. Say that again. Yeah. <laughs> also, if you're, if you're job costing in real time, your, your prices are increasing as your needs are increasing as, as your, I mean, I, I don't think it's some big, enormous shift. If you know what things cost, you know what you're planning for. Um, like, you know, this year to 2023, we're off, we're for the first time, actually Christmas is our first one, which I'm so proud of. So we're about a year and a half old. Um, we have paid holidays for all of our employees this year. I'm like so stoked about it. Um, and that's just, so we just build that into our plan and so we can accommodate it. So, um, and I totally agree. I mean, you, you're selling, you're selling trust. Um, you're not, I mean, painting is part of it, but, and it's a big part of it, but, um, there's so much more to sell. I, I'm not ever nervous about being two or three grand over the next estimate. I'm offering something completely different. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. It's not, it's not upsetting to me at all. I had a customer, gosh, they were agonizing. They were like, oh, we don't know what to do. You're almost double the price. And I said, well, well let's, let's chat about it. You know, what, what can I do to help you? You want to go through, you know, and just talk about each line item on the estimate. And they're, they're just like, you know, I just, it didn't stress me out at all because I know exactly why I'm pricing this historic exterior this way. I, I know exactly what we put into it. We just did one just like it this year. And so I just got to walk through it with them, just line item by line item and just describe all that goes into this, the safety, the equipment, you know, the, the time we have to take to do four colors on your, you know, essentially like, you know, ornate trim, wood trim, the, the carpentry work. You know, they didn't go with me and I, did, I didn't even blink an eye. Like I know... And they were like heartbroken about it. So I don't know. And they did say to me, oh, we really want you to be our backup. And I thought, you know what? We're probably going to end up paying this house because they're going with something. I don't know if that guy's even going to show up this summer. So, um, you know, you just, you got to know your business and who you are. And the, the money is on the table. The customers are there. You, you do have to find them, they have to find you, but it is not a, you're not competing with, I'm not competing with any paint contractor in my area. I, yet, I don't know if that's gonna ever happen, I don't know. Yeah, your your own, uh, your competition is your ability to execute on your business plan, as Jason Perrin says. Uh, Jason Perrin as says, Brad Ellison um, says. <laughs> yeah, have you ever seen the office? Dash, dash Brad Ellison, dash Jason Perrin. <laughs> You know, guys. Our, uh, yeah, yeah. I actually have that. I actually have that hanging on my office wall. The uh, Wayne Gretzky, uh, Michael yeah. Scott quote. But Jason, uh, there is a question I want to. I want to address it real fast. I'm trying to make sure we hit all these from Jeremy. He said, "What are you using to view the scoreboards?" I would love my team to see the numbers to help with growth and mindset. Jeremy's going to have to come visit me in Dallas if he wants to answer that question. You got to fly there, man. Got to yep. fly there, Jeremy. <laughs> Jason will be a great host. I'll, I'll, uh, 
open the doors on what we use. It's a, it's a web-based software called Gecko Board, and it, uh, it mostly tracks our metrics that the team can see. Um, it, it does some of the internal stuff for the leadership team too, but uh, it's very visual. Just Google Gecko Board. You could pretty much back anything into it. Awesome. Yeah, I like that year, that transparency with the team. Helps everyone trust, helps everyone get on board. And, and again, as Lauren said, working towards that common mission. We're not in the industrial age anymore. We don't have people just working on assembly lines, you know, putting the car parts in, whatever. People want to be part of something bigger now. You have to market. Uh, Brad's big on this. You have to market to employees. You have to pitch them a vision the same way you do to homeowners. You got to treat it all the same as all marketing and sales and giving them an opportunity to get something great from your company. Otherwise, just the way that you would be a, a, viewed as a commodity potentially by a homeowner, you're viewed potentially as a commodity by a, a potential employee. And then it all comes down to dollars and probably they're going to go somewhere else, even if they pay them less, but they treat them better or they can sell them some kind of future or vision or, or give them a, a why, a why they want to work there, why they, they are investing their time, they're investing their life into your business. Why should they go invest their life into okay. your business? There's nothing more valuable than time. You cannot get time back. You can get money back. And the challenge, I, I'm, I'm like harping on this, but I really challenge people to question whether they, you should be, are, are you the business owner? Because if you don't deeply love people, you don't love setting them up for success and giving them an employee or a subcontractor experience that is really meaningful, that helps their families, that helps their, their, them accomplish their goals. I just like, I really question if that's where you should be, because I just have found this to be um, absolutely intrinsic to business success, just on a very foundational level. Um, Jason, what do you think about that? Do you think that's true? About whether someone should be a business owner or not? If if they don't love people, if they don't love people and their like, success for someone else and really get some sort of there's some sort of satisfaction. It doesn't have to always be like you're the exact same way, but if that's not satisfying to you to set other people up for success. Well, then you're going to be stuck as an owner operator forever. And maybe that's okay. Maybe that's the way you want it. That's how most small businesses in America are. But if you really want, you know, do you want to be the cobbler? That's the only guy that makes the shoes and he's there, you know, uh, or your, or your stereotypical restaurant owner, who works seven days a week, like 12 to 14 hours a day. And it's the family run business and mom and dad don't even have a life Well, your, you know, your contracting business can be the same way. Mm -hmm. Why not? If we're going to use EOS terms here, delegate and elevate. And when you, when you delegate well, um, you empower other people to grow and to begin using their, their skills. And it, everybody's better off when you lead well and you delegate well. But if, like, if you don't, if you don't like people, you're not going to be a good leader, period. If you don't like people, you're going to say, well, that's the kind of boss I am. If they don't like it, it's my way or the highway. You know, that, that, that's the kind of boss I am is guess what? You're only going to get one type of employee and you're going to be, again, you're just going to be stuck in a rut. And I, I hope you are in love with people because we are in the people business, the people we serve, the people who deliver our products, unless you're the only one delivering your product. Yeah. Brad, you have something to add? Yeah. I mean, if we're, if we're talking about asking ourselves the hard questions there, the, the hard truth is that there are people that are not cut out to be the owners of successful, thriving painting businesses. And, and some of them can run the owner operator painting company and make the money they want to make and work the schedule they want to make. And that is success in and of itself. But s some people are not cut out to run a company like Phillips Home Improvement. That's the, the truth of the matter. They may not have the sales ability. They may not have the people management ability. Uh, they may not be able to create a culture that's healthy and thriving and growth oriented, but they might be a phenomenal director of operations. They might be a great project manager. And the reality is that some, some, of, some owners of painting companies probably should close up shop and go work for someone else. They would likely make more money work less hours and have way less stress than they have trying to just trudge along through this, you know, one job at a time. When's the next one coming? I'm losing a guy. I hire a guy, lose a guy, I hire a guy, lose a guy. That's just, the, that's just the fact of the matter. And I'm, it's not trying to be dismissive of those guys, but there are, there are some people that are cut out for business ownership and there are some that are not. 
So Brad, in addition to what you just said, I totally agree with what you just said. There's a lot of people that go into business because they don't want a boss. And, and a lot of times the reason they don't want a boss is because they're not very disciplined. And if that's the reason you're in business, you're not, you better be self-disciplined and have more discipline if you're going to succeed in business. Again, everybody's definition of success is what it is, is, is for them. Mm -hmm. But if you just got into business because you wanted to be your own boss, well, you know, you're, sir, you're, you're serving a crazy person. <laughs> and there's different ways to have success as a business owner within this industry too. And this is something that Brandon and I have talked about at great length is I look at my subcontractors. We only use subcontractors as, as partners. Each of them has their own business. And my goal is to help them grow their business. Now, my goal in helping them grow their business is to grow through subcontracting work from Ellison Painting. But if they, if there's a language barrier, for example, and they're not great at sales or they're not great at communication, they don't want to build these big marketing systems and spend the money for marketing, but they still want to grow their company. Well, great. I have the perfect vehicle for that. I'll do all the sales. I'll do all the marketing. I'll do all the project management. And you just keep recruiting painters that you can effectively manage and produce a high quality uh, paint, painting service. Mm -hmm. And we're both going to win. You're going to grow your business. I'm going to grow my business. And you can still be technically working for yourself, uh, but more as a partnership with Ellison Painting, right? So there's there's a million different ways to to succeed within this industry. And that might be at the $15 million range. It might be the $150,000 range. It might be being the owner of that big company. It might be simply as being a painter. Some people love painting. I love those guys, by the way. I want to uh, I want to run through a couple more questions. <clears throat> We're running out of time. We got about four more questions to get through at least. Uh, Matt or Brad, if one of you could just quickly say what the EOS system is, because some people have asked about that, they're not really sure what, what everyone's talking about. Go ahead, Matt. Brad, I was going to say go. You go. I think you follow it more strictly than what we do. Okay, so EOS is based on a book called Traction by Gino Wick Wickman, right? Wickham. Yep. Wickham. Yeah. And uh, in that, the EOS stands for Entrepreneur Operating System. It's basically a system by which you can run your business. And they focus on a lot of different things, such as uh, establishing your core values, your mission statement. There's a worksheet called the VTO, which helps you track your, your 10 year picture and your three year plan and your one year goals and your quarterly rocks and your one month issues. And it, it really just helps to have a hyper focus on what you want your business to be, how you want it to operate, and how people are supposed to operate within it. So it's been really useful for us. It's, it's funny because me and my project manager, Ron, are going through it now chapter by chapter as a team. And some of it is clearly geared towards companies that are way larger. You know, when they're talking about have, creating an org, org chart, okay, well, our org chart is me and Ron, and that's it. And all the responsibilities are between the two of us. But it's also allowed us to create uh, an org chart for what it's going to look like in 2023. And now all of a sudden we're up to five employees and, you know, hopefully 60 subcontractors and our bookkeeper and our marketing partners. Uh, so it, it, it's, it's fundamentally a system by which you can grow your business in a healthy, strategic way. And I highly recommend if you haven't read the book, read it and then don't just read it, implement it. Awesome. So yeah, think, it, it allows you to, to budget, to plan for your company. Matt? I would say, too, there, there are uh, companies or people out there that do the full-on 100% follow that system. I think if you get 50% of the way to following it, you are so far ahead of the competition. Yeah. yeah. So don't get and overwhelmed and, and, and worry about doing everything with it. I mean, go, go for it if you can, but just do something. I'm glad you said that. That book is pretty, pretty in depth. And even if you just implement one thing at a time and, and over the next three to five years, try to implement all of it. That's great. Jason. One of the things that I run into a lot of people who say they're not good readers. I've got a story about that, about me, but you know, something you can do with, with that book and most books, M most business owners are driving around their truck all day, get you an audible subscription, download the audio book and just listen to it while you drive. Mm -hmm. If it piques your interest, you can go get the Kindle book or the hard copy book and highlight things and make some notes. If nothing else, just listen to the audio book. It's only like four hours total. And that's if you listen to it on a snail's pace. Yeah. All right, we have a, oh, go ahead. Can I add, sorry, Brandon, that oh, kind of like what Matt said, just taking it, taking it as a resource, it's meant to, it's meant to benefit you 
even if your company's small, even if your doesn't look exactly like everything else. I think it's so important that, um, you know, your company doesn't need to look like any of these companies here. Um, it doesn't need to look like Nick Slavics. It doesn't need to look like these are all just resources that you take and you can you can uniquely fit into your systems and your plan and um, and make it work for you. And then just just shut off the stuff that doesn't doesn't apply or doesn't fit and and do something that that really is unique. It doesn't take away from how independent and personal your business is. Some people get nor nervous about your business feeling corporate feeling, uh, you know, overly, you know, sort of generic. And this is, it's really, it should be the opposite. Mm -hmm. um, it, I, I do EOS as well. Um, for someone who is, wakes up every day wanting to reinvent how I live my whole life. I mean, that's just my personality. It's such a great, great structure. You might not love how it feels at first, but it really gives you so much freedom um, to, to keep your goals and to really narrow down what, what you want to stay focused on. Um, so don't be afraid of it as someone who's super independent and like hates rules. I will tell you that it's been an amazing, um, amazing thing for, for me personally. And I'll just add one more thing about that is even if you just start it and you, you establish what your company's core values are, just having those in place and written down and top of mind has the potential to really change how your business operates. And it's to Lauren's point, my five core values are probably different than Lauren's. And my core values shape who I'm recruiting and how I'm building my company and same for her. So even if you just went through that and stopped there, didn't have the, the heart or the stomach to finish it, every company should have their core values or even the, the independent owner operator should have his or her core values laid out and determined. Just put a little bit of thought into it, write it down on paper. And even that alone, that one little step could make a huge difference in your business. Oh, let me take it one step farther. If you don't, I had trouble establishing those. I actually was like upset by the idea that I had to like write these down and like cling to them. I, I actually think the process of even just thinking about what your core values might end up being. So I have like a running list of like seven and like and, and like and like the other day when we had quarterly reviews i was like oh my gosh that one really like i felt that one really leading from just like talking with all my employees um even if you're even if you're trying them on just the idea of doing that is is like it it's weird how it comes back and it starts it starts to become kind of a almost like a languageless word starts to kind of like the definition it's sort of like chicken egg and the definition of your company, what you are, you start to figure it out. So even if you don't have them, you know, set, I think the idea of thinking about them is an, a great exercise and just is a super benefit to your business. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks, guys, for diving so deep there. I want to run through these next two questions really fast. Uh, Speed round. We have some other going up. I want to be respectful of your time, of everyone listening's time. Uh, one question is direct mailers to HOA communities to get on on the radar um, of the HOA boards to be one of those three, three estimates, yay or nay. I think you're sending it to the wrong person. If you're wrong trying person. to, if you're trying to get to the HOA and the board, you don't need to send it to the, the residents of the HOA. Reach out to the, the board and, and directly and go have a there's, conversation. With typically there's a, there's a property management company that's in between the board and the resident. Okay, perfect. Um, and then Jason, do you separate the sales and project management roles and, and do the salespeople sell all three services, roof gutters, painting? Yes, we do have sales and project management 100% uh, separated because the personality style or behavioral styles of, of those of the needs of, of the people that succeed in those positions is, is greatly different. Um, and uh, the, some of our people sell everything but most everybody, you know, they start in our system, they learn painting and then they uh, then they learn gutters and they might then after that learn how to sell uh, roofing or or uh, or we do some windows as well. Awesome. And I, I want to keep this. <clears throat> this next question kind of opens up a can of worms. So hesitant to ask it, but it is important. Uh, so I want to keep it hopefully to, to three or four minutes here. But I had a, an experience recently uh, as part of our pre-sale system for Painter Marketing Pros. We have custom video templates that we actually work with with our, our painting company partners to roll out uh, that go to new leads, 
that go before an estimate, that go after estimate, video the owner. Um, one of the owners we, we work with was hesitant to get on film and record these 30 second videos because he is an immigrant to the United States. And he felt that his accent might uh, be a turnoff for some of the homeowners. Obviously that that's not ideal. Not, none of us likes to hear that. Um, but he felt that the reality was it might hurt his close rate. Does anyone have, it's a, it's a, it's a sensitive topic. Does anyone have anything they want to address with that? Yeah, man. I, 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 embrace who you are. It might be hard at first, but it, it's going to, I mean, that's who you are. That's your business. You can't hide behind yep. not showing a video. That's all. Love it. Own it. Don't, don't. Yeah. I mean, the people, my, my, my thought is the people who are not going to, who are going to be turned off by that, so to speak, are probably not people you want to work with. Okay. And I would say if this person is um, thinking that the language barrier, the accent is an, is an issue, uh, then they likely think that's an issue with their, their sales process. So, then they should hire a salesperson. Make your life easier. If you if you don't feel confident in your sales ability, then hire someone to do your sales and you focus on owning and running the business and managing the projects. And that person could be the person on camera. That That's what I did at my last company. It wasn't a language barrier, but the the founder of my last company uh, was older and didn't really want to do it. And I am hap was happy to do it. So I became the face of all of that. Love that. Uh, I do want to make sure as we're planning for 2023, I am a very big on this um, for the PCA Expo mm. uh, for 2023, February 22nd to the 24th in Albuquerque, New Mexico. I'm, I'm always astounded by people who are members of the PCA or not members of the PCA. And they say, well, maybe I'll go. I'm not really sure. Go, right? Go. What it, so I guess let's run through each of you and what what's one or two of the biggest uh, takeaways or the biggest value adds from the Expo for you. I wouldn't be connected with anybody in this video if I wasn't there. And everybody in this video uh, has impacted my business in a positive way. Yes. Brad. I mean, the connections are incredible. Same thing that Matt just said. I would just like to make a plug on the Thursday of the event at 1030. I will be giving a speak at the exact same time as uh, Jason Phillips. Who's, so um, pick your poison. If you want to, if you need nap time, go to Jason's speech. If you want to be razzled and dazzled, Come see Brad Ellison. Or bring oh, yeah, different different time. No, so no I'm debates. bringing my leadership team so that I can, we can split off. And one of us will be at Brad's and one will be at Jason's. We're not going to miss any talk between the three of us. And I'm going to make them do homework. It's going to be terrible. Um, you go to the expo. Honestly, the secret to me about things like expo, there's all these like there's all these tangibles like, okay, we can network like tangible. I can like metric that I can like learn, connect. Um, I can, you know, all this, all those things. The thing that I think is the most valuable is flying away from your state and having a set of days where you think about your business and you take a break out of the paint shop off out of the field and you're surrounded by people in the field so many of whom are inspiring and you're doing that brainstorm you're doing that recalibration you're asking maybe i would recommend you ask the hard questions of yourself you use that time to really think about what your business what you want it to be who you want to be and you're going to look around you're going to see every version so many versions of this trade and so then you can also get inspiration and that's the thing that i think is the most for for a lot of people that's the thing that i think is number one um and of course like it if you're not doing this business with colleagues with friendships with team members if you're not doing this in collaboration you are missing out not just on what you'll give you get but what you can contribute to other people and jason I would say it's three, you know, for me, I would say there's three reasons why you need to go. The first one is exactly what Lauren said. You get away from your business, you're in a new environment, you're transplanted and your mindset is different. And you can begin working on your business and not just in your business. You're out of the, you're out of the whirlwind. That's the first thing. The second thing is there are uh, vendors at the trade show that you didn't know existed mm -hmm. that you need to yeah. connect with. And, you know, let's just say there's a, you know, a hundred people there, a hundred vendors there, and you find one that solves one problem for you. 
that one golden nugget or that one connection is going to make the whole time worth it. And then the third one is, uh, you know, like Brad said, the networking, the connections, it's not just networking. We're going to hang out and hang out after hours and shoot the breeze and be buddy, buddy. You know, a lot of people see that as unproductive. It's, it's, it's because you get to network with other experts who have solved a problem that you haven't solved yet. Mm-hmm. And then not only that, you're going to make friends with them. You can call them up later. They're not the competitor down the street that has, you know, you don't share with and won't share with you. Hey dude, I've got this big problem. How did you guys, have you guys run into this? How did you solve this? And people are going to be open and transparent about helping you up your game, level up your game. Mm-hmm. So that's the three reasons the, the power of networking, the, uh, the trade show and the, the mindset in focusing on your business. Yeah, you, yep. can tune, and have, you can tune into the podcast that I just recorded with Brandon. There's going to be four episodes, and it's all about how I launched a business from zero to one and a quarter million dollars simply off the backs and knowledge and resources of my friends within the industry that gave freely of, uh, of what I yep. needed. Yeah, there are. And as Jason was just saying, learning from other companies, there are these, this is a really awesome thing. Every single day, brain melts. We actually sit around a table, with 10 or 15 other company owners, and you just solve problems based on whatever the topic is on that table. Mm-hmm. Um, someone had asked, Hey, I'm a small business owner. How do I work on the business? What are resources for small business owners? This is it. Go there. You're going to network with people who have gotten there. Some will be small, some will be large and you learn how to work on rather than in your business. This is where you, where you get that knowledge that you need. Um, I am on the the marketing committee for the PCA. So anyone who goes from this, I'm going to give you a referral code. One of our, I'm I'm actually not, but I'm trying to drive up expo attendance and I want to be able to say I did. So also don't. Brandon, don't sold. forget that there are scholarships. I had my first expo completely paid for. I mean, not the hotel part, but the whole, I mean, that's, you know, $800, $900. Allowed How do they apply for that? They, you go to PCA, there's scholarships. They have like six of them. And I think it's three and three. Three are like you've never been before. Three are returners. You should apply for a scholarship. I think that they could use more applications. And this is like, this is like, the way that you get to go, I think, especially for a first timer, mm-hmm. it's a no brainer. And they can find that on the, on the PCA's website or, or should they email someone? I would so go we'll, to the we'll website. Put a comment. We'll and put then a comment. We'll, so we'll I'll find the link and post about the pay, at least the paint ed site, if I can remember to put it up because people should know yeah. they can do that. And this, this recording is going to be posted in the paint market mastermind podcast form. If you listen to it or you listen to the recording and you have questions for Matt, Brad, Lauren, or Jason, or me, remember, you can always tag um, any of these people in that group and they'll answer it. Uh, and then we'll also put a comment with a with a link to what Lauren was just saying, how you can apply for a scholarship to attend the expo. Is there anything else you guys want to add? We're two minutes over. Anything uh, as we wrap this up? Thanks for putting it together, Brandon. Hopefully it was valuable for yeah. everybody. Oh, so one person did ask, Tony asked, when's the next one? So we're going to we're going to be looking to to do these live rounds probably every month in the beginning in this Facebook group. And then that will probably probably go to every two weeks. So we will have this group uh, of experts back on again, because they're amazing. Thank you for everyone who showed up. Uh, thank you everyone who watched the recording. And thank you most of all you guys for, for sharing your knowledge and experience with us. Appreciate you guys. Thank you Thanks. guys. See y'all. See you guys. Christmas. If you want to learn more about the topics we discussed in this podcast and how you can use them to grow your painting business, visit paintermarketingpros.com forward slash podcast for free training, as well as the ability to schedule a personalized strategy session for your painting company. Again, that URL is paintermarketingpros.com forward slash podcast. Hey there, painting company owners. If you enjoyed today's episode, make sure you go ahead and hit that subscribe button. Give us your feedback. Let us know how we did. And also, if you're interested in taking your painting business to the next level, make sure you visit the Painter Marketing Pros website at paintermarketingpros.com to learn more about our services. You can also reach out to me directly by emailing me at brandon at paintermarketingpros.com and I can give you personalized advice on growing your painting business. Until next time, keep growing.